Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons that's prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is on the book of Matthew. It's a very interesting one, and we're getting close to the end of Matthew. If you remember something about, like in Matthew 24, this lesson is going to talk about last day events. It's lesson number 11, and it happens to fall on June 11 of 2016. Before we begin this, because now we're talking about whose day? Our day, okay? Very important information about our day, so I think let's begin with a word of prayer. We may understand these materials correctly. Our kind and loving Father. We think about our time, and it seems like it's been so many years since you were here. And we, we wonder why it has wait, you have waited so long, and even so long since the Great Disappointment in 1844. Why are we still here? Well, in this lesson, we will see some of the answers that you have given at different times and under different circumstances. May we understand them as we should, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Issues connected with the second coming. We have been focusing on the first coming. Now, think about this. Was there any reason for Jesus to come and do all that stuff he did the first time if he's not coming back? Was it just a fun exercise? No. Not exactly? <laughs> so really... He's not coming back? What do you yeah. mean? Well, I mean, if he never intends to come and save the righteous, he just says, well, I'm done now. I'll just stay in heaven. You people can go on living on planet Earth forever. Would, be, would there have been any reason for him to come the first time? Well, there's, there wouldn't be any reason, but the, the, the length between the first coming and the second coming is completely, yeah. could be anything. Yeah, we're, we're, we're going to talk about that next. In 1863, let's... So, actually, there was some purpose that was the, to teach the universe, but yeah. if he didn't come back a second time, the universe would see God in a different light than they, yeah. than they will see, and do. What, one, of the, one of the things that he's supposed to be teaching is that it will be possible for him to have a group of people, not just one here and one there, but a group of people who will stand up during the worst time in this world's history and say, we understand God well enough, we've studied carefully our Bibles, we will not budge. This is what we believe, believe about God and we will not accept any of Satan's lies. And that has not happened yet. Well, in 1863, a small group of Adventists, with a small a, organized themselves into the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Now, there are various reasons why they did that. They thought that the keeping of the seventh-day Sabbath and the soon coming of Jesus were the most important and most prominent truths that they believed. And so, what name did they choose? Seventh-day Adventists. That's how our name came about. Were they wrong about the nearness of the second coming? Don't everybody speak at once. Depends on your perspective. Depends on, depends on your perspective. Now more than 171 years after the great disappointment of 1844, we are still here. What went wrong? Why has there been such a delay? Well, look at a few passages from Ellen White. The long night of gloom is trying, but the morning is deferred in mercy because if the master should come, so many would be found unready. Why is he delaying? We haven't done our job. We have not done our job, and so many are unready. So more of us can be ready. God's unwillingness to have his people perish, his people perish, has been the reason for so long delay. And that's Testimonies, Volume 2, written in 1868. A long delay in 1868? What is she talking about? Well, it only took the Israelites 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. How, we've been going more than four times that long. Yeah? Wandering well, back, around. This was only 24 years after the Great Disappointment. You know, the, the only thing that 
kind of wonder about that statement is that she says that we're not ready yet for him to come. Well, everybody back then that were not ready yet are dead. Mm -hmm. So there's more people rising again, mm -hmm. more people coming. Mm -hmm. So why does he keep delaying as if it's just going to be replaced by people that aren't going to be ready? Well, let me ask that question. That's a very good question. Let me ask it in a slightly different way. What would God to Ellen White say if she were alive today? I think she would ask the same question. <laughs> <laughs> what would God say to us individually about the delay? Well, for one thing, the delay was prophesied. Yeah. I mean, the, 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 the parable, parable of the, of the ten, virgins yeah. does that prophesied it, so it's... About it, 171 years and well, more? Well, there's no time limit to that prophecy. It could go for a million years. Well, here's another one, okay? Again, I'm using Ellen White. This is found in a document which wasn't widely man, uh, uh, circulated until the book Evangelism came out. It's in pages, and back there's a number of comments ab about this general subject in the title entitled entitled in the chapter entitled the reason for the delay in the book evangelism 694 to 697 something like that okay so here's what she said in that pat in that those chapters had adventists after the great disappointment now these are not seventh day adventists these are adventists before there ever was a seventh day adventist church after the great disappointment in 1844 held fast their faith and followed on unitedly in the opening providence of God, receiving the message of the third angel and in the power of the Holy Spirit, proclaiming it to the world. Now, how many Adventists were there in 1844? Do we have any idea? Just a handful. No, I mean before the disappointment. Oh, many thousands. I don't know. Hundreds of thousands. I yeah, think. estimates have been somewhere up between 100 and 150,000. How many were left after the disappointment? Not many. Uh -huh. Well, there were a few. There were some, a few I mean, thousand. Maybe I mean, 5,000. Generous. Day, the Seventh day Adventists were just a small part of those Adventists mm -hmm. because there were still a lot of Adventists that kept going. They were called Second Advents, mm -hmm. the Second Advent movement. Mm -hmm. They were there after 1844 and they, they dwarfed the Seventh-day Adventist Church for quite back a while. then. Well, if we had followed on receiving the message of the third angel and in the power of the Holy Spirit proclaiming it to the world, they would have seen the salvation of God. The Lord would have wrought mightily with their efforts. Sorry. The work would have been completed and Christ would have come ere this to receive his people to their reward. You know when that was written? 1883, 1883. But in the period of doubt and uncertainty that followed the disappointment, many of the Advent believers yielded their faith. Thus the work was hindered and the world was left in darkness. Had the whole Adventist body united upon the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, how widely different would have been our history. It was not the will of God that the coming of Christ should be thus delayed. Now, I will tell you that I've heard a lot of people say, well, God knows when it's going to happen. He has a date set. So we can't hasten that day. We can't delay that day. So what's the big deal? Well, God did not design that his people, Israel, should wander 40 years in the wilderness. For 40 years did unbelief, murmuring, and rebellion shut out ancient Israel from the land of Canaan. What shut them out? Unbelief. Murmuring, rebellion. The same sins have delayed the entrance of modern Israel into the heavenly Canaan. In neither case were the promises of God at fault. It is the unbelief, the worldliness, unconsecration, and strife among the Lord's professed people that have kept us in this world of sin and sorrow so many years. 1883. Now, well, when you read that, are you saying that it could have happened before? 
Oh, she says that. She says no, that. she didn't say that. She just said if we would have done that. Well, isn't that but the fact is, it didn't happen. So, yeah. so it isn't true because it didn't happen. Well, but it would have happened if no. she, told, she said yeah, well, well, that's true, but it didn't it happen. Yeah. That's the thing. Yeah. It didn't happen. Yeah. She says, if we would have done all yeah, this. That's right. That's a conditional sentence. That's a conditional sentence, but it didn't happen. Yeah. So it's not really a true statement. It's just, it's just something that could have happened if these things would have happened, but they didn't happen. Okay. So it's not true. <laughs> now we're gonna, well, it didn't happen, otherwise we wouldn't be here. We would not be here if that had happened. And well, you know, if 3,000 years or 200 years ago, if the moon would have fell on the, on the earth here, it would, we, we wouldn't be here crazy either. Things, but we don't need well, that. well, that's what I'm saying. That's making my point here. No, that it is if. This is a statement from God. It's not a crazy thing. No, 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 no. no. I'm saying if the earth would have fell on the earth 200 years ago, we wouldn't be here. Yeah. Isn't that true? That's true. That's true. Well, she's saying the same thing. If God would have came during that time, then God would have came. If we had been faithful, God would have come at that debate. time. That's a different, very different thing. No, no, that, it's still saying the same thing. No, it's not. No, no. Oh. Okay, let me let me get you. Let me go I, to another one. Yes. My question. No, it's still going to say the say the same thing. Uh, it's an if statement. It's what? an if statement that didn't happen. But this reason. It wouldn't be. A, it wouldn't be an if statement if it had happened. That's right. Absolutely, but it didn't happen, and so it's so, not true. My question here is, <laughs> looking at the world from our current perspective, mm -hmm. in the 1880s, they were just getting, they'd had telegraph, a, a few steamships, most of them were still sail or high proportion. Mm -hmm. Africa was basically an unknown, but it yeah. was populated. Mm -hmm. It would have to have taken miracles, and I think it could have been done, but it mm -hmm. does make you pause as against the technologies we have today to finish the work if mm -hmm. we really get into it, and I think we are doing better now than we did then. There's, that's not saying there's not room for improvement. Yeah. There always is. Well, in 1883, five years later, there was a conflict at the General Conference session. In 1888. Eight, what did I say? Three. Oh, I'm sorry. 1888. Three years, I mean five years after the statement in 1883, let me make that clear, there was a conflict which led Ellen White to make the following statement sometime later about the outpouring of the latter rain. Okay, what, what, what happens in the outpouring of the latter rain? What do we call that? Well, the latter rain, which, what's that supposed to lead up to? Second coming. The second coming. Everybody doing the An unwillingness to yield up preconceived opinions and to accept this truth, we're going to have to, we don't have time to discuss what this truth is, lay at the foundation of a large share of the opposition manifested at Minneapolis against the Lord's message through Brother E.J. Wagner and H. Jones. By exciting that opposition, Satan succeeded in shutting away from our people in a great measure the special power of the Holy Spirit that God longed to impart to them. The enemy prevented them from obtaining that efficiency which might have been theirs in carrying the truth to the world, as the apostles proclaimed it after the day of Pentecost. The light that is to lighten the whole earth by the action of our, I'm sorry, the light that is to be lightened the whole earth with its glory was resisted and by the action of our own brethren has been in a great degree kept away from the world. And now that's pretty scary. That's something that really did happen. Well, that it was, was a kept cause away. and effect thing. It that was, that was the cause and effect that make yeah. it not happen. You know, all I'm saying is that I believe God knows exactly when he's coming. He wasn't surprised about that, us that not doing something, yeah. and then he didn't come. So yeah. he was not surprised about that. The, so the I, question I just isn't whether we can surprise God. The question is whether he would have come sooner if we had prepared ourselves. And the answer is... He didn't come because we didn't prepare ourselves. Well, the fact is he didn't come. Mm -hmm. And that's the truth. What he said, and so he knows exactly he when come. he's going to come, and he will come during that time. But is anybody sad here at this table that he didn't come back then? What's that? Are you sad that he didn't come? Well, yes. But Why? You wouldn't be here. 
<laughs> I'm glad he didn't come back so then. How do you feel about how do you feel about the delay in the second coming? That's the question. Why do you think there has been a delay? I think everything is in God's hands and it's going to work out exactly how he had foreseen it. Well, that that's how true. he had foreseen it but not how he wanted it to be. He that's didn't it. want this he no, didn't want whatever rebellion. Whatever going to be happen is what he wanted well, to happen because... He didn't want Adam and Eve to do what they did. But he did people on need to understand what needs to be understood, and it, it happened. That's the old oriental, what will be, will be. be. Yeah. That's no, what I didn't say that. I just said that, I just that, said that God, I just said that God knows exactly what he's doing. It, Everything is in question, God's hands. No question. But she said, this, my earlier comment, uh, I like the enemy prevented them from obtaining the efficiency which might have been theirs. In other words, Edison might have done his thing and we might have had what we've got today, a whole gener, way back. I think God, I mean, and this is my speculation, I think God has allowed us to develop the, the, the communication possibilities, et cetera, that we have available now because it's time for it to happen. So, some of us can remember generations past who have stated with great conviction that they thought Jesus would come in their day, but he has not yet come. Why is that? Sin has never been permitted to show its true nature, so to yeah. speak. We've never had a time in the history of the universe where that could happen. It's, it's very interesting to observe that God seems to use delay frequently. Think about Joseph. Think about Abraham and Sarah. Think about Caleb and Joshua, etc., etc. Well, in light of all these issues, let us take a careful look at what Jesus said, as recorded in Matthew 23 and 24, about the Jewish leaders in his day, and then about the destruction of Jerusalem and his second coming. God had chosen the children of Israel to be his special people. We know that. His friends Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had been promised the land of Canaan as the future home of their descendants. At the time of the Exodus, while camping at the foot of Mount Sinai, they received a message from God which said, and I quote from Exodus 19, 5 to 7, Now, if you will obey me and keep my covenant, you'll be my own people. The whole earth is mine, but you will be my chosen people, a people dedicated to me alone, and you will serve me as priests. So Moses went down and called the leaders of the people together and told them everything that the Lord had commanded him. Unfortunately, and we know what happened, over the next 40 years they rebelled again and again until finally God was forced to say that he was not taking them into the land of Canaan because they deserved it, but rather because he had promised it to their ancestors. Exodus 32, 13, Deuteronomy 9, 5, 10, 15, and 11, 9, and fulfilling that promise was necessary to uphold God's reputation. Exodus 32, sorry, 11 and 12, and Numbers 14, 13 to 19, Deuteronomy 9, 28 and 29. And I might add, we're quoting a lot of passages here. If you'd like to get our handouts, they're available online at our website. That's theox dot org, not dot com, dot org. Unfortunately, the children of Israel did not follow through on their covenant with God. And this is a verse which everybody tries to avoid, I'm sure, but I'm going to read it. 2 Kings 21, 9 through 11. But the people of Judah, now we're talking way down just before Judah is taken into Babylonian captivity. The people of Judah did not obey the Lord, and Manasseh led them to commit even greater sins than those committed by the nations whom the Lord had driven out of the land as his people advanced. Does this help us to understand why Jesus said to the cities of Bethsaida, Chorazin, and Capernaum, if, I, if the things that you have you've heard from me had been spoken to Sodom and Gomorrah, they would still be here. Through his servants, the prophets, the Lord said, King Manasseh has done these disgusting things, things which are far worse than what the Canaanites did. And with his idols, he has led the, peop the people of Judah into sin. 
If you want to get more details, read 2 Kings 17, 7 through 23. Now that's going back to talk about the downfall of the northern kingdom of Israel. But you can, you, the southern kingdom was not really no different. About 80 to 90 years after the return of the first exiles from Babylon to Jerusalem, Ezra and Nehemiah arrived in Jerusalem with a determination to straighten things out. Now, we don't have time to talk about all the things that were going wrong, or intermarrying with the, pay, with the foreigners, and etc. The result was what we now know, and by the way, they were there, especially Nehemiah was there, to repair the walls so they could actually have a wall that would protect them against their enemies. The result was what we now know about in Jesus' day as the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They were so busy carrying out their religious duties that they did not have time even to think about what they were doing. Could we make the same mistake? If we join the Seventh-day Adventist Church and comfortably ride along on the Adventist so-called bus, will that guarantee us a place in heaven? Doesn't it? No. <laughs> well, Matthew 23, if we had time to read the whole chapter, is a terrible diatribe against the leaders, you know, just, well, let's just look at uh, a couple of the passages. I'm going to start with uh, verse 13. How terrible for you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. And I, I shouldn't say it like that. Jesus, I'm sure, spoke these words with tears in his voice, and I don't know how to do that. You, how terrible for you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You lock the door to the kingdom of heaven in people's faces, and you yourselves don't go in, nor do you allow in those who are trying to enter. How terrible for you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You sail the seas and cross whole countries to win one convert, and when you succeed, you make him twice as deserving <coughs> of going to hell as you yourselves are. Wow. You know, seven times Jesus condemned these. It says the teachers of the law. It, most places right. it calls the scribes, mm -hmm. and seven times he condemns them. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't. It wasn't because they were doing what was right. They were misrepresenting God in their teaching. But you go back to Jeremiah eight verse eight. It says the scribes have made it into a lie. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, not a whole lot new under the sun. Well, you drop down to verse thirty-eight. And so your temple will be... And notice, earlier, hey, Jesus had called the temple what? Earlier in his ministry? God's house. My Father's house, right? Look what he's saying now. And so your temple will be abandoned and empty. From now on, I tell you, you will never see me again until you say, God bless him who comes in the name of the Lord. Wh when will that be? What do you mean by your temple? Second well, that's what I just asked you. He's saying to the scribes and Pharisees, it's not my father's house anymore. You have desecrated it so long, my father's abandoned it. It's yours. So, there's an interesting statement. Here's something to think about. This is not part of the regular Sabbath school lesson, but they go over this, and I just thought I would point this out. There's an interesting statement in Matthew 23, 35. Let's just look at that for a moment. As a, result of the pun as a result, the punishment for the murder of all innocent people will fall on you, from the murder of innocent Abel to the murder of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Okay? Who is it that got murdered between the temple and the altar? Zechariah, but not the son of Berechiah. If you go back to 2 Chronicles 24, verses 20 and 21, we read, Then the Spirit of God took control of Zechariah, son of Jehoiada, the priest. He stood where the people could see him and called out, The Lord God asks why you have disobeyed his commands and are bringing disaster on yourselves. You abandoned him, so he has abandoned you. King Joash joined in a conspiracy, conspiracy against Zechariah, and on the king's orders the people stoned Zechariah in the temple courtyard. This took place ab around the year 800 B.C., okay? By contrast, there's another Zechariah that talks about it in Zechariah, the one who wrote the book of Zechariah in chapter 1, verse 1. In the eighth month of the second year that Darius was emperor of Persia, 
the Lord gave this message to the prophet Zechariah, the son of Berechiah and grandson of Iddo. He began his ministry around 520 or 519 BC. So how many years is there between these two? Almost 300 years. <coughs> Notice it was not Zechariah, son of Berechiah that was stoned to death, but rather it was Zechariah, son of Jehoiada. Matthew made a mistake. Do I dare to say that? You mean my Bible's wrong? Well, does it bother you? Well, let's look at some more details about this story. In the Hebrew Bible, 2 Chronicles is placed at the end of the Bible. That's their last book in the Bible. Malachi is, we put Malachi at the end. Malachi is up a, farther forward in their Bible. The last book of their, of their, what we would call the Old Testament, they call it their Bible, is 2 Chronicles. So when Jesus mentioned Abel from Genesis and Zechariah from 2 Chronicles, he was including all of the biblical history and he was recognizing that there was already a kind of order in the books of the Old Testament. That's very significant for people who are trying to figure out when did they sort of recognize which books were inspired and which books were not inspired. Remember, the kind of books we use have not been invented yet. We are not going to throw Matthew out because he made a small historical error. I certainly hope not. Matthew was human like the rest of us. Some people want to reject Ellen White because on one occasion she gave the wrong number of rooms in a hospital. Ellen White was also human. I think that's an important lesson for us. Well, as we know, a great transition was about to take so place. Are you suggesting that the Bible was not verbally dictated by God? There's plenty of reasons. This is just one tiny little reason. There's lots of reasons to say that God, the Bible was not dictated verbally by God. Lots of reasons. And maybe we should have a session on that someday. But maybe there. we have. <laughs> <laughs> well, we just talked about one. This a great, a great transition, transition was about to take place in God's relationship with the human family. And what was the transition? No longer were the Jews his select chosen people. After Jesus died and rose again, going back to heaven, the disciples began to understand the mission he had assigned to them. And they, pre and they preached those incredible sermons at Pentecost and other, and other times that following. The family of God expanded to include all who responded to his call. Now we know, for historically, that it took the disciples, even God's disciples, a long, Jesus' disciples, a long time to finally admit that uh, well, maybe the gospel should go to the Gentiles too, right? We don't have time to go through all of that right now. But let me just show you one very interesting passage found in Acts 11. I believe it's starting around about verse 29. Let's see. A little bit before that. 20. Well, let's start with uh, verse 19. 18, I think you want to start. Mine says 19. Oh, well. 11, 18. When they heard this, they stopped their criticism and praised God, saying, Then God gave, has, had given to the Gentiles also the opportunity to repent and live. That was a conclusion at Jerusalem. Some of the believers, here's the part I want to emphasize. Some of the believers who were scattered by the persecution which took place when Stephen was killed went as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, telling the message to whom? Jews only. But other believers who were from Cyprus and Cyrene, where is Cyprus? Well, we know where Cyprus is. Cyprus is that island out there in the, in the Mediterranean. Where is Cyrene? Libya. In Libya. They went to Antioch and proclaimed the message to Gentiles also. What it says literally, all those who speak Greek, but that includes Gentiles. Telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's power was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. And we don't even know the names of those people who first really made it their job to preach the gospel so Libyans to the Gentiles. Libyans went to Syria to mm -hmm. proclaim the gospel. Libyans went to Syria to proclaim the gospel. Isn't that incredible? Thinking about our history today, incredible. And where did, how did that gospel spread? How did that work spread? 
Well, Barnabas went up there and said, what in the world's going on up here? And he got involved. And he says, we need more help. And what did he do? He went and called Paul. He said, get down here and help us. And so Paul and Barnabas, pretty soon, they're out there preaching the gospel straight to the Gentiles. And that's how it started. Well, look at John 12, 20 to 26. How, how long after that happened did Peter have the sheep come down? Well, that was before. That, that was quite a long time before, yeah. So... Peter, the message should have gotten to the, Jew, to the Jewish leaders, that, well, to the Christian Jews, long before that. But it didn't. What we read in Acts 11, 18 mm -hmm. was actually Peter's message yeah. to the church. Yeah. After saying, saying this is because of the, uh, the sheep coming down, yeah. this is why the gospel should go to the Gentiles. Yeah. But it still took several years before it, for it yes. to actually happen. Even for Peter. Yes. So, some Greeks were among those who had, now we're going back to the final days of Jesus in the temple. Some Greeks were among those who had gone to Jerusalem to worship during the festival. They went to Philip. Who was Philip? One of the disciples. One of the disciples from Bethsaida in Galilee and said, Sir, we want to see Jesus. Famous Greek words, Thelemon blepen Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, and the two of them went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, no, notice these very interesting words. The hour has now come for the Son of Man to receive great glory. What does that mean? I am telling you the truth, a grain of wheat remains no more than a single grain unless it is dropped into the ground and dies. If it does die, then it produces many grains. Those who love their life will lose it. Those who hate their own life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever wants to serve me must follow me so that my servant will be with me where I am and my father will honor anyone who, who serves me. And he goes on to have that incredible experience where God himself spoke to him in the temple courtyard. We don't have time to talk about that right now. We got a comment? Matthew 24. We know this is a famous chapter. Look at that. Jesus left and was going away from the temple when his disciples came to him and called to call his attention to its buildings. Ellen White suggests that they, they generally went to the, uh, let me think if I get to the east, to the west. They generally, no, they generally went to the east from Jerusalem, past, Beth, past the Mount of Olives and out, to, out to, toward Bethlehem on, on the evenings to find places to stay. So they're, they're up on the top of the Mount of Olives, and now they're looking across, and they can, they're just about the, exactly the level of the temple. And they're looking at this gorgeous, immense monument that, the, that Herod and others have, have spent thousands of years on to, to build, and they just think this, thing, this is the most wonderful thing that ever happened. And what does Jesus say about it? Not, stone. Not a single stone here will be left in its place. Every one of them will be thrown down. As Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives, and there it says Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him in private. Tell us when all this will be, they asked, and what will happen to show that it is the time for your coming and the end of the age. And what did Jesus do? He said, well, I, oh, let me give you the exact date, right? No, he didn't. No. He mixed up events connected with the destruction of Jerusalem with events connected to the end of this world. So Ellen White comments about that in the Tsar of Ages, page 628. Jesus did not answer his disciples by taking up separately the destruction of Jerusalem and the great day of his coming. He mingled the description of these two events. Had he opened to, the, uh, had he opened to his disciples future events as he beheld them? So did he know what was going on? Did he know what was happening? Yeah, they would have been unable to endure the sight. What does that mean? They're not seeing it. He, they're just hearing about it. In mercy to them, he blended the description of the two great crises, leaving the disciples to study out the meaning for themselves. This entire discourse was given not for the disciples only, but for those who should live in the last scenes of this earth's history. Once again, Desire of Ages, page 628, paragraph 1. But if Jesus himself tells them something, you, know, you would think that would be the end of it. 
Well, they should, they should take it seriously at least. How, how are they going to go and study for themselves if they have something that Jesus says and he gives what seems to be a confusing picture? Mm -hmm. Well, throughout Matthew 24, I'm going to suggest he made it very clear that the final events in this earth's history will be a terrible time for Christians. Why is that? What does the devil know? If we remain faithful, he's finished. It's all over for him. Okay? But, uh, but fortunately, if we stay faithful and endure until Christ comes back, it will be a wonderful and unique experience. Unique because how many times has had God had to like start over? There was the flood. There was Abraham. There was the children of Israel. There was the Christians. There was the Protestants. There was the Adventists, we would say. I mean, how much longer is this going to go on? Christ has promised us a home with him forever. What did he say about the future of Jerusalem and the Jewish people? Now, look at those verses. Matthew 24, 15 to 24. You will see the awful horror of which the prophet Daniel spoke. It will be standing in the holy place. Now, that's very interesting. Because what do, they say, what do skeptics say about the book of Daniel? That it was history rather than prophecy. Okay, but everybody admits, because it's even in the Dead Sea Scrolls, everybody admits that it was written at least by 165, 160, somewhere around 165 B.C. We believe that it was written by Daniel back 530 plus B.C. But at least everybody said, oh yeah, at least by 165 B.C. Now this is almost 200 years later. And what did Jesus say? You will see. What does that mean? It's still future, right? Jesus said these words that everybody admits, whoever wrote it, even if you don't admit Daniel wrote it, whoever wrote it 200 years ago, it's still future. It will be standing in the holy place. Notice, note to the reader, be sure to understand what this means. Then those who are in Judah must run away to the hills. Now you don't warn people what to do if it's, if it's past, do you? Nope. Someone who is on the roof of his house must not take the time to go down and get his belongings from the house. Someone who is in the field must not go back to get his cloak. How terrible it will be in those days for women who are pregnant and for mothers with little babies. Pray to God that you will not have to run away during the winter or on a Sabbath, for the trouble at that time will be far more terrible than any there has ever been from the beginning of the world to this very day. What does that make you think? Nor will there ever again be anything like it. But God has already reduced the number of days, and had he not done so, nobody would survive. For, this, for the sake of his chosen people, however, God will reduce the days. You think he was talking just about his chosen people there? As far as the world being so terrible? Well, look, look just, I'm just going to pick out those specific passages. Matthew 24, 21. That time will be far more terrible than any there has ever been. For who? Well, at least for Christians. Well, I mean, it doesn't say that. It just says it's a terrible time. Okay. It could be everybody. We don't have a... They can't, you think Satan is going to be taking a vacation on the Riviera as, this, as the end of the world approaches? Well, that, Come on, use your head. No, okay? but, but listen, what, what is that going to tell me? I mean, I'm not going to be able to tell what the, Satan's going to do. I mean, why you even don't bring have that up? evidence about what Satan's going to do? Well, look what happened during the plagues of Egypt. What happened to the, the children of Israel during those plagues? Well, after the third plague, I believe it was, they were protected. They were protected. Mm -hmm. So you can admit even during that time, the plagues, the, the plagues were terrible. Mm -hmm. they, were, they were terrible to everybody. Mm -hmm. But God's people were protected. Yeah. So it's still possible that could be happening there. I read on. Daniel 12, verse 1. Then there will be a time of troubles the worst since nations first came into existence. 
Revelation 7, 14. He said to me, these are the people who have come safely through. He's talking about God's faithful people have come safely through the terrible persecution. That, that almost mean? sounds like what I just said. They came safely through. So, so just to make a blanket statement that everybody is going to be terrible for everybody, you can't really say that. But it might be, you might be right about that. One of the elders, let's go back to verse 13 in Revelation 7. One of the elders asked me, who are these people dressed, dressed in white robes? And where do they come from? I don't know, sir, you do, I answered. He said to me, these are the people who have come safely through the terrible persecution. They have washed their robes and made them white with the blood of the Lamb. That is why they stand before God's temple and serve Him day and night. So forth and so forth. So, uh, you, can, you can read it either, either of those two ways if you want. Um, well, well, the thing is that people are looking at this thing was, was, that it's just for sure that everybody's going to go through hell. Yeah. It almost gets to the point that nobody wants to pray for the Lord to come mm -hmm. because they don't want to go through that. Yeah. But it's yeah. possible that well, there'll be some protection there for be. the no. people that are relying on God. But that doesn't mean they will be totally protected. Well, that's true, but there's no way that you're going to set a level of protection. Well, the destruction of Jerusalem was an absolutely horrendous, awful event. Christ saw in Jerusalem a symbol, I'm reading from Mal, from Great Controversy, 20, verse 20, chapter, page 22, sorry. Christ saw in Jerusalem a symbol of the world hardened in unbelief and rebellion and hastening on to meet the retributive judgments of God. But Jesus had warned them, Luke 12, the his Christians, Luke 21, verse 12, 22, 22. When you see Jerusalem being surrounded by armies, you will know that its desolation is near. Then, those, let, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those who are in the city go out and let those in the country not enter the city. For this is a time of punishment in fulfillment of all that has been written. Fortunately, Christians took his warning seriously and we read about what happened. When Christians in Jerusalem saw this happen, they fled out of the city. I'm reading now from our Bible study guide. Saw this happen. They fled out of the city as Jesus instructed, whereas most of the Jews were left behind and perished. It is estimated that more than one million Jews perished during the siege of Jerusalem with 97,000 more taken captive. And now I'm going to read from a few other uh, sources. However, during a, this is from the SDA Bible Commentary. However, during a temporary respite, when the Romans unexpectedly raised their siege, their siege of Jerusalem, all the Christians fled, and it is said that not one of them lost his life. Their place of retreat was Pella, a city in the foothills east of the Jordan River, about 17 miles or 27 kilometers south of the Lake of Galilee. What do we know about Pella? There's the names Pella in Greek or Tabachat. Paul in, in Arabic, is found in northwestern Judah, uh, I'm sorry, Jordan, south of the Sea of Galilee. Pella represents one of ten Decapolis cities that were founded during the Hellenistic period and became powerful under Roman jurisdiction. With the his history extending back into the Bronze Age, that would be the days of Moses, Pella expanded to its largest sta state during the reign of the Roman Empire. According to Eusebius of Caesarea, Pella was a refuge for Jerusalem Christians in the first century A.D. who were fleeing the Jewish-Roman Jewish wars. The fighting finally stopped when Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans in 70 A.D. And where is that found? I think we've got the, well, we've got two quotes here. But the people of... That's from Wikipedia, you say. That's just from Wikipedia, yeah. And, and, and the references are there in Wikipedia. Uh, but the people of the church in Jerusalem were not, had been commanded by a revelation vouchsafe to approved men there before the war to leave the city and to dwell in a certain town of Perea called Pella. And when those that believed in Christ had come thither from Jerusalem, then as if the royal city of the Jews and the whole land of Judea were entirely destitute of holy men, the judgment of God at length overtook those who had committed such outrages against Christ and his apostles and totally destroyed that generation of impious men. Eusebius, A History of the Church, 3.5.3. And here's another comment. Eusebius and Epiphanius of Salamis 
in Cyprus, who lived in A.D. 315 to 403, and there's his, um, his reference, mentioned Pella of the Decapolis as a place of refuge for the Christian community of Jerusalem in A.D. 69 and 70. And there's the references, the Anchor, Anchor Yale Bible Dictionary, etc. It's hard to read about the destruction of Jerusalem. It is even harder to imagine that the events connected with the second coming of Jesus will be even worse. And I know I've done a lot of reading, but listen to these words. Terrible will be the calamities that fell upon Jerusalem when the siege uh, was resumed by Titus. The city was invested at the time of the Passover when millions of Jews were assembled within its walls. I mean, imagine. You have this huge crowd of people coming to Jerusalem for Passover, and all of a sudden, whoosh, here comes the Roman army. What do you do? Their stores of provisions, which if carefully preserved, would have supplied the inhabitants for years, had previously been destroyed through the jealousy and revenge of the contending factors, and now all the horrors of starvation were experienced. A measure of wheat was sold for a talent. So fierce were the pangs of hunger that men would gnaw the leather of their belts and sandals and the covering of their shields. Great numbers of the people would steal out at night to gather wild plants growing outside the city, outside the city walls. Though many were seized and put to death with cruel torture, and often those who returned in safety were um, robbed of what they had gleaned at so great peril. The most inhumane tortures were inflicted by those in power to force from the want-stricken people the last scanty supplies which they might have concealed. And these cruelties were not infrequently practiced by men who were themselves well-fed and who were merely desirous of laying up a store of provision for the future. I mean, imagine, here's the leaders, the rulers, the powerful people, stealing food, tiny bits of food from people who were starving just so long that make sure that they wouldn't run out themselves. Thousands perished from famine and pestilence. Natural affection seemed to have been destroyed. Husbands robbed their wives and wives their husbands. Children would be, have, would be seen snatching the food from the mouths of their aged parents. The question of the prophet, can a woman forget her sucking child, would receive the answer within the walls of that doomed city. The hands of the pitiful woman have sodden their own children they were their meat in the destruction of the daughter of my people. What does that mean? They ate their children. They ate <clears throat> their children. Now, it doesn't say whether the children died and then they ate them, or whether they ate them, whether they killed them in order to eat them. Isaiah 49, 15 and Lamentations 4, verse 10. Again was fulfilled the warning prophecy given 14 centuries before. And this, is, this is now from Deuteronomy. 28, verses 15, it's 15, 6, and 57. Uh, the tender and delicate woman, woman among you, which would not adventure to set the sole of her foot upon the ground for delicateness and tenderness. Her eye shall be evil toward hus the husband of her bosom and toward her son and toward her daughter and toward her child, which she shall bear. For she shall eat them for one of all things secretly in the siege and straightness wherewith thine enemy shall distress thee in thy gates. Now, um, I, I just need to mention something here. The book of Deuteronomy, we believe, was written by whom? Moses. Moses. That was about approximately what time? We already told you. 1,400 centuries before Christ. The prophecies, well, we just read one of them. The prophecies in the book of Deuteronomy were so precisely fulfilled in the history of the Jews all the way down here to the destruction of Jerusalem that many critical scholars say it's impossible that the book of Deuteronomy could have been written way back there. There's no way anybody could know that, that all those things were coming. So Deuteronomy had, and they would say that Deuteronomy was written somewhere around maybe 300, maybe 400 years before Christ maybe by Ezra or somebody like that, okay? The Roman leaders endeavored to strike terror to the Jews and thus cause them to surrender. And listen to this. This, is just, this just blows me away. Those prisoners who resisted when taken were scourged, tortured, and crucified before the wall of the city. 
Hundreds were daily put to death in this manner. And the dreadful work continued until along the valley of Jehoshaphat and at Calvary, crosses were erected in so great numbers that there was scarcely room to move among them. So terribly were visit, was visited that awful imprecation uttered before the judgment seat of Pilate, his blood be on us and our children. Matthew 27, 25. Great Controversy, page 31 and 32. I mean, try to imagine. People would try to sneak out and get some food or sneak out even and try to surrender to the Romans. And what did they do with them? Beat them, and torture them, and crucify them. And the crosses were so close together you could hardly walk between them. Imagine the soldiers who were trying to supposedly defend Jerusalem, which of course they couldn't, but standing on the wall, and what do they see down below us, below them? Yeah. I think Josephus leaves you in no doubt as to what went on. Yeah. Uh, I think he, as I remember, even mentions that temporary lifting of the siege. Yeah. And as as you read, the <clears throat> Christians, because they listened to warning. what Jesus had said, they left. Mm -hmm. The others could have left too. Yeah. But well, the other thing, though, that as soon as they left, then I heard the Romans. Start again. The Romans left after they left. No, the Romans left temporarily, and the and the 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 Jew the Christians escaped. Yeah. Then almost immediately the Romans came back. Yeah, oh, so so they cleared out of the way. Yeah. When for the Christians to leave. Yeah. Well, it's a good thing they were listening to prophecy. Yes. Why do you think the people in, even in our, why do you think that people even in our day try to imitate Christ? After all, he was only a poor itinerant Galilean rabbi, right? Who was crucified as a criminal. So if one does not believe that he was indeed God's only son, why would anybody today be trying to imitate him 2000 years later? Fortunately, Scripture gives us a clear picture of the second coming of Christ. Uh, look at a couple of these passages really quickly. Matthew 24, 27. For the Son of Man will come like the lightning with flashes across the whole sky from the east to the west. And then dropping down to 30. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky and all the peoples of earth will weep as they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great joy, glory. The great trumpet will sound. He will send out his angels to the four corners of earth and they will gather his chosen people from one end of the world to another. Is this going to be a secret rapture? No. No. And look at Revelation 1.7. Look, he is coming on the clouds. Everyone will see him, including those who pierced him. All peoples on earth will mourn over him, so shall it be. Now how are the people who pierced him going to be able to see him? Special resurrection. Special resurrection. Jesus intends to come back himself. Um, I guess I have a moment to read this next verse. Remember John 14, 1 to 3? Do not be worried and upset, Jesus told them. Believe in God and believe also in me. There are many rooms in my Father's house, and I'm going to prepare a place for you. I will not, I would not tell you this if it were not so. And after I go and prepare a place for you, I'm going to do what? I will come back and take you to myself so that you will be where I am. That's pretty clear, isn't it? His coming will be visible to all who are living and it will be very loud, loud enough to wake up the dead. Interestingly enough, that is exactly what the Jews were hoping would occur at the time of Jesus' first coming. First coming. With our, will our hopes be dashed as theirs were? Do we have any false ideas about what might happen to us and how the actual coming will take place? The second coming and the events connected with it are the Christ, Christian's ultimate hope. Without that hope, we will rot on the ground just like others. However, we need to understand that either at the second coming or at the third coming, everyone will be raised from the dead. John 5.39, what does it say? 5.29, I'm sorry, 28 and 29. Do not be surprised at this. The time is coming when all the dead, how many? 
oh. all the dead will hear his voice and come out of their graves. Those who have done good will rise and live, and those who have done evil will rise and be condemned. As eager as Christians have been to see the second coming of Christ, it should not be any surprise that some have tried to set a date. And of course, we know that that's false stuff. It should be clear that since we have no way of knowing when that day will take place, we must be ready at all times. In, in one verse, look at Matthew 24. And this, this will be our last comment for the day. Matthew 24, 34. Remember that all these things will happen before the people now living have all died. What does that mean? Literally, it says the people of this generation. Dr. Richard Lehman, writing in the Handbook of Seventh-day Adventist Theology, says that the Greek word translated generation corresponds to the Hebrew word door, which is often used to designate a group or class of people such as a stubborn and rebellious generation in Psalms 78.8. Thus, Jesus was not using the word to depict time or dates, but to depict a class of evil people whom he had been referring to. That's one of the best definitions I've heard of that verse. In harmony with this Old Testament usage, Jesus would have used the term this generation without a temporal meaning to refer to a class of people. Uh, the evil generation would include all who share evil characteristics and we might add, to the end of time. In other words, evil will remain until the end of time until Jesus comes back. Well, in his usual style, Jesus ends with a parable, Matthew 24, 42 to 51. We won't have time to read it now. The unfaithful servant was not ready when the master returned, and he suffered a terrible fate. But those who were ready received a great reward. Eternal vigilance is our only safety. Some of our Christian friends have very different ideas about the millennium and how the second coming is going to happen. Those who have been martyred in, in Revelation 6, 9 to 11, we read about those who have been martyred. They are figuratively asking God why the delay. And God responds by saying, wait a little while longer. Do you foresee many more martyrs in the future? Are you prepared to stand firm for the cause of God no matter what? The challenge goes out to all of us. We are living in what could be the final days of this earth's history. Are we trying to hasten it, as Second Peter suggests? Our kind and loving Father, once again we thank you for the privilege of reviewing quite a few words that you have given us about these events. We need not be unaware, unknowing, ignorant of these events. Help us to prepare ourselves to Bible study and prayer and witnessing to others for the day, that great day when we will be able to look up and see you coming in the clouds is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.